Yes, Professor. Okay, so I uploaded the files again, that ends with dash R, R stands for revised. So it's gonna be like revised, um, you can see your slide set. And we went through this already, maybe a couple of times. And we went to the RBS design and this is exactly what we were working on. So I'm gonna jump to it. And I guess we understand how to do the shear here on the RBS, which includes a probable shear, VTR, which is this, this is what you call here mechanism shear. And then um, also we were able to check the moment at the face of support is gonna be M sub F, which includes mechanism moment plus a little bit coming from this eccentricity, the distance. So we're gonna treat this as a short cantilever. The length of it is gonna be equal to this SH. Now it's gonna be a new SH. The first one, the first SH was measured to the center of the column. Now it's gonna be measured to the face of the column. Let me just go back here quick and show what, what that I'm talking about. The first SH was the center of the column. This is to figure out the L dash or L sub zero. L sub zero is gonna be the length. If you guys remember, L dash or L sub zero here is gonna be center to center. L dash from plastic inch to plastic inch. And the other S sub H is to figure out the moment at the face. And as you see here, moment at the face is giving the problem moment, the mechanism moment, plus the effect of this eccentricity. You take the probable shear, multiply by this distance, plus the effect of a little bit of gravity loads from here to there. Now, MPE is going to be actually, this going to be the moment, the plastic moment of the beam that you want to be sure that this MPE is going to be greater than this value here, the phase moment due to mechanism. And P in this case is going to be taken as one. Well. Uh, we were talking about the Doppler plate and continuity plate. We said that continuity plate is going to be needed and actually you're going to be concerned here about the flange, the strength of the comp. And um, we're going to be doing this check here for TCF, which means um, you need to be sure that the flange thickness of the column is going to be greater than this value here out of this analysis. If not, you need to add the continuity plate. It is recommended to have the continuity plate anyways. So even in some cases, when you're doing the design check and you see here the values are very close, you just add it. It's gonna be only one case that we don't really need to add it when it comes to the roof connection. So right at the roof is gonna be the top level. You don't really need to do it if numbers are okay. But in many cases, you come here to the top of the column and you like to add the David socket. Um, for the window washing equipment, now this is gonna be for complete different reason. You maybe you'd like to add this continuity plate on the top. Because think about this. Now you go here to the top level, right? Which is right at the roof. And you may want it to attach something here on the top of the column. So this two plates is going to provide a good seat to it. Otherwise, you need to have a cap plate on the top of the column to attach some equipment on the top. So in many cases, we just add these two plates for continuity plates for the equipment that you may want to attach at the roof. Uh, in my situation, I'm going to say, let's just add it and let's put it there. This is a slide that I changed. Actually, this gave me the only slide I changed here, slide 31, if you'd like to take a note of this. It was kind of confusing when you're looking here at some values. I'm going to show you exactly what the confusion is about. Look here at this detail for any uh, W section. We have something called here K, and then we have also K1. Look where is K from, from where to where. K is gonna be from the top of the flange to the end of this K region, which means this, uh, I'm gonna say this round section or this round piece here. It's gonna be to the bottom of it. And T is gonna be the maximum length of a plate that you can attach here to the web. So if you like here to come and add a plate, you can add here a plate, the maximum length of it or height of it, if you like to call this length or height, is gonna be equal to T. This is why this is gonna be the end of this rounded piece, right? This is going to be K. So if you like to attach a plate, you don't want to really to be exactly equal to T, maybe you're going to make it a little bit smaller. By how much? It's going to be up to you. Maybe you give it maybe a quarter of an inch or so. So this is K. 
K1 is giving to the same point here for this round. Um, I'm gonna say here, interior corner to the center of the section. So this is gonna be the axis or the center of the section itself, which is all y axis. And K1 is gonna be that distance from the end of this uh, quarter of a circle all the way to the center of the section. Now, in order for us to figure out the strength needed, because you're gonna have your some trends, right? You're gonna have some forces coming from the flange of the beam and going to the web of the cone. So number one, you're gonna have a force coming this way. It's gonna be like tension force. I'm gonna assume for now it's gonna be tension force. This tension force, you'd like to transfer it first. All of this tension force, you'd like to transfer it as intention to this phase. And this phase is gonna be here, the interface between the continuity plate and between the flange of the cone. So you have a tension force that you'd like to push it through the plate. After this, you're gonna be taking the same force and transfer it to the web of the cone. And for that, now you are gonna have full transfer of all the force that you have in the flange of the beam all the way to the column web. So I'm gonna be considering here about two cross-section areas. The first one is gonna be the interface between the plate, this plate, and between the flange of the cone, which is this cross-section area. This cross-section area, I'm gonna call it here A sub P B. This section or this cross-section area is gonna be exposed to tension because look what happened here. You're gonna have tension force coming from the beam flange to the column flange to the continuity plate. So this cross-section area is gonna be equal to what? It's gonna be equal to this width. I'm gonna call it here the width for the BB plate for the flange. And this width here, if you look at the equation, this width is gonna be equal to the B, the width of the continuity plate. And B of the continuity plate is gonna be measured from the face of the web all the way to the edge of the cone. So we're gonna say this is gonna be the width of the plate, of the continuity plate. I added this equation here from the same reference, from the same example. It says the width of this continuity plate is gonna be equal to the width of the flange of the column. So where's the flange of the column? I'm gonna say flange of the column is gonna be, this is gonna be BF, right? But this is gonna be BF for the column, BCF, which means BF of the column, the whole distance from here to there. Take this distance, subtract TCW. What's TCW? Here is TW. TCW is gonna be for the column. Now we divide by two, and this is gonna be the width of the continuity plate. So width of the continuity plate is gonna be from this point all the way to here. I'm gonna call this width of the continuity plate, which is this value here, right? Now you need to reduce it a little bit. You cannot really do it this way. You need to have this cut. You see this cut? You need to have this cut here. Otherwise, you're gonna have lots of concentrated stresses. So I'm gonna say, I'd like to put this plate right here. Just imagine that I'd like to put here the continuity plate, right? I'm gonna do it like this. Okay, extend it all the way to the bottom. Now I need to avoid this K1. So what the equation here says, you're gonna be taking this continuity plate, you're gonna be adding this K1, and then you add additional quarter of an inch. I'm gonna say, but in here, you have subtracted already the web thickness of the column. Does this make sense to you? You see this one here? It says here, BCF, which means entire width, subtracting the web, divide by two. So this gave me the width of the plate. Look, when you look here at K1, K1 is measured from where? K1 is measured from the center of the beam all the way to the end of this piece. And then you add a quarter of an inch. So now look at what width we're talking about, this width here. This width, actually, when you think about it, you see here that we double counted K1 twice. One time when we subtracted TCW, and the other time when you subtracted K1 of the comp. Does it make sense to anyone? Listening to me? Yes, I think it just takes a moment to add up all the pieces. Okay, but you see here that we are double counting the subtraction of this K1. Yes. You guys see this? Anyone else? Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I see it. You see mm -hmm. it, right? Because it says here the web, right? The, the, the plate width. The plate width is measured from the face of the web all the way to the end of the flange. How is that? Look at this equation. It says it's gonna be the entire width from here to there. And then you subtract T web, right? 
and then divide by two. Now I have here, this give you the width of the plate. Now you come back again and then you subtract K1 as if, as if K1 is really measured from the face of the web, right? The way that I see it here, as if K1 is measured from the face of the web, but in reality, K1 is measured from the center of the column. So you are kind of double counting it, right? But this is what the AIC recommendation says. But when you look here at the detail I gave you, it just showed this to be K1 minimum. So this reference that we are using to double count the K1 effect in our example. And it's gonna be up to you if you double if you like to double count it or if you just like to do it according to this detail. This detail is the actual detail that we use in our design and our analysis because we believe that this is kind of maybe a mistake or a typo or maybe someone didn't give it enough attention, but it's gonna be up to you. If you guys decide to use this equation because you're gonna say, well, this is gonna be the example we have available, go ahead and use it. If you like to take the width of the plate and instead of subtracting this TCW is gonna be up to you. So if you like to ignore this piece, I'm gonna be okay with it. It's gonna be just BCF divided by two. And after you do this BCF, the total width of the flange, and then divide here by two, it's gonna give you the center. So the center actually that I'm using in my design, we use the center here or the plate width all the way to here. And then the width of the plate, we subtract K1, and then we have on the top of it a quarter of an inch. So in this case, if you like to ignore this TCW in this equation, it should be fine. If you like to include it, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be a little bit more conservative. So it's gonna be up to you. So one way to do it, just ignore this cross that I just put, just use the equations as is. But you're gonna come back with a question. You're gonna say something here doesn't make sense. I'm subtracting here K1 kind of twice. I'm double counting it. So I'm gonna say yes. So in this case, you can just cross this out and use these two equations together and you should be fine. So actually it's gonna be up to you guys. Okay. So this here, this gonna be the cross section area here exposed to tension, APB, PB, right? And look at this equation here, it says APB is gonna be equal to the width of the plate multiplied by thickness of the plate, two items multiplied by each other. So here's the first one, the width of the plate, and here's the thickness of the plate. Usually, if you like to choose a thickness of the plate, you make it very close from the flange thickness of the beam. So let's say flange thickness of the beam is about, let's say, 5 8 of an inch. I'd go 5 8 of an inch. It's going to be a weird number, a little bit larger than 5 8, and it's more than 3 quarter, go 3 quarter of an inch. This is a typical size that we usually use. 3 quarter of an inch, maybe an inch, maybe 5 8, something like in this range. So you take this width, Yeah, Ho, do you have a question? Oh. All right. No, I don't have questions. Okay, thank you. So this cross-section area exposed to tension is gonna be called APB. It's gonna be equal to that width multiplied by the plate thickness. So now I understand I'm gonna have some tension force coming from the flange of the beam transferred here to this plate. Now, after this, this is going to be transferred here to the web of the column through shear. So this section here is going to be exposed to tension, and then it's going to get transferred here to this web as in shear. So now I need to figure out this width here, this cross-section area. This cross-section area, which is equal to that width from this point, you guys see the hand, the pointer, to that point multiplied by the plate thickness, I'm going to call it here APW. Now, where do we have this? Let me take you here to this equation. It says APW is gonna be equal to the thickness of the plate multiplied by, so here's the plate thickness, right? Multiplied by what? Depth of the column, subtracting twice the flange thickness of the column. I say, okay, let me go back here. This is gonna be, here's the column. The distance from here to there is gonna be the depth of the column subtracting two times the flange thickness, which means at the end, this, width that you are talking about is gonna be from here to there, right? Are you guys following? It's gonna be exactly from here to there. It's gonna be this distance from here to there. Now, what is K? Look at K, definition of K. It goes from the top of the flange to this corner, right? To this point here, this is gonna be K. Look what happened here. 
in my opinion, we use this K is gonna be from the outside of the flange all the way to that point, right? I'm gonna call this to be K plus one and a half inch. You say, okay, K plus one and a half inch. is gonna be the total distance. But look at this equation. It says D minus two CF, okay? Which means this distance from here to there. And then again, subtract two times because you have two sides. K plus one and a half inch. Again, here they are double counting the K region. So this K is double counted in that length. So you need to understand if you like to use it this way, you're good. This is gonna be kind of cons conservative uh, like approach if you like. But if you like also, you can just cross out this term here. See which term I'm gonna crossing out? The flat thickness calculation. So I am personally in my spreadsheets, I don't use this. I don't subtract it for this, right? I just cross this out, I don't use it, right? I don't use this term here, I don't subtract it. I just say this gonna be DC subtracting two times K plus one and a half inch, which is sufficient in my opinion. Why? Because you're gonna be doing something like this. You're gonna be taking the K plus one and a half inch from here and then K, right? K is much from here to there, plus one and a half inch. I'm gonna say this is enough. I was able here to avoid the K region by additional one and a half inch. This is enough. But in this equation, you double count the effect of this K region or subtraction of the K region. This also makes sense, what I'm trying here to address in this equation. Okay. okay. So it's gonna be up to you. If you like to follow this equation, it's gonna be okay. If you like to subtract, to take this out of the equation, not to subtract the flange thickness of the column, in here, it's gonna be also okay. It's gonna be up to you. I said, okay, now I understand. I'm gonna have one area is gonna be exposed to tension and one area exposed to shear. Now let's also think about the welding. Now, where's the weld is gonna happen? Weld is gonna happen top and the bottom of the plate, right? On the top and the bottom from the other side. So for this force coming from the flange of the beam, transferred here to the web of the column, you're gonna have four lines of will to resist it. In each side, you're gonna have two plates, right? You're gonna have a plate in each side. And for each plate, you have top and bottom well. Okay, all right. So let's see how this is gonna happen or what's gonna happen. For the strength of this plate, right? I'm gonna have four equations. One equation is gonna be based on the tension and strength of the plate. The other equation is gonna be about the shear strength of the plate. Because now you take the force through here, right? First, you're gonna transfer the force through tension. So you're gonna see the, tens the tensile strength of the plate. And then after that, you need to transfer it through shear to the web. So you're gonna have the shear strength of the web, of the plate through the web. It says here the following calculations, identify the controlling design strength. So we're gonna have here four values for the strength. And certainly are gonna be take the smaller of all of them. So the smallest values is gonna be the one that you need to use in your, um, in your analysis, in your design. The first one here, if you look at this, it says phi multiplied by F sub Y multiplied by A, P, B. Now this gonna be the section exposed to tension. A, P, B is gonna be this cross section area, which is right here in this equation, multiplied by this by phi factor and also multiplied by F sub Y. This gonna be the tensile strength that we have done earlier in this course, right? So this equation is simple. You just figure out the tensile strength of this phase. So what's the second? I'm gonna see the shear strength on the side. And what, what do we call this area here? It's gonna be called APW to the web. So look at the second equation. Second equation, which is item B, it says take phi factor of one, multiply by 0.6 Fy. This is gonna be the standard when we do the shear strength. It's gonna be 6% of F sub Y. Apply by APW. What's the, again APW? APW is gonna be this cross section area of the side. It's gonna be this side here. We call this APW. So, okay. Second equation. Third equation says here C step 11. It's gonna be something here called panel zone strength. We're gonna be coming to it, right? So, they say for now, just put it aside. Once we cover the panel zone strength, we're gonna come back to it. The third one here, it says, if you take here MPE, do you remember what's MPE? Phi times MPE? Okay, what is MPE? MPE is gonna be the strength of the section of the beam, this section here. 
not of the RBS, is giving you right here. This is the one that we compare it with M sub F. Let me take you back. Where is M sub F? Here's M sub F. And here's MPE multiplied by this phi. So if you take here the strength of the beam itself, which is the strength of the beam right here, not of the RBS, right? This is the one that you checked it against M sub F, the moment at the face of the con. It says here, in item D, if you take this moment capacity divided by the depth of the beam subtracting TBF, what is TBF? It's gonna be the thickness of the beam flange. As if you are taken from the center of the beam to center of the beam. I'm gonna say, what is DB minus TBF? I'm just trying to understand what, what is the meaning of this physical meaning. I'm gonna say it means the distance from the center of the flange, right? To the center of the flange. When you have tension compression here, so the distance, clear distance, give be equal to the depth of the beam, total depth of the beam, D for the beam, subtracting TF for the beam itself, which means one half from the bottom, one half from the top. If you take the moment, divide by this depth, is gonna be an amount of tensile compression in the beam, which means I'm trying here to find out the total tension that goes from the beam to the cone. Take this tension, right? So you're gonna be taking this tension. And then say the trends that I need to resist is gonna be equal to what? It's gonna be equal to the tensile strength of this phase, shear strength of this phase, pan and zone strength, or the amount of force that get transferred from the beam to the cone. There's nothing else. We just covered all of them, but the new one is gonna be the panel zone strength. And then says the smallest of A through D is gonna be used to design the weld. What weld? Well, you need to weld here this plate, right? You're gonna be welding the plate here through tension, right? It's gonna be exposed to tension, which is the same equation for shear. And also you're gonna be using it to resist the shear transfer from the plate to the column web. So you're gonna be taking here the smallest value of all of them, which means you're gonna be taking this force or this tension force, tension strength of the plate or shear strength of the plate or the bandit zone shear strength and then desi design here the weld thickness. Look at the equation for the weld thickness. It says here D minimum. If you remember D is gonna be number of ticks of an inch. Do you guys remember the 1.39? If you look here at the welded connection, that was yes, the professor. amount of shear strength per inch, per one sixteen of an inch. That was the value that we used there. So it says here, take the smallest of all of these. So where's the smallest of all of this? I'm gonna say this gives me the smallest value of all of these four items. Take this strength here. Divide by two, why? Because I'm gonna have here weld on the top and the bottom. Divide by 1.392, divide by the length of the plate. Which length of the plate? I'm gonna say this gives me the length of the plate, this one here. This length that I just put here is gonna be this length from here to there. Come, you can come up with this length here and then use it to be the length of the weld, right? The multiply by two, multiply by 1.39, multiply by the weld thickness to give you the weld strength. And you wanna be sure that you covered all of this four parameters or four items when it comes to the strength of the continuity. Is it okay? This is fine, I guess. I'm gonna say here, this is not big deal because if you don't wanna use minus two C TCF, you can just take this out of the equation if you want to, if this is gonna help you. Otherwise, just leave it there in the equation. You're gonna see here the last check that you need to do, which is a column panel zone. How would you check this, the column panel zone? Now here's a column. I know it is modeled as just one line, which is fine. So this gave you the column. And here's the beam, the intersect at this. This gave you the panel zone. The panel zone is gonna be this area of the column and the beam that the overlap. We call this the panel zone. This is what we, where we usually put the Doppler plate. So in here, I'm gonna say the force that you start with is gonna be this MF. And if you remember MF, it's gonna be the moment at the face of the column, it's gonna be right here. 
This MF is equal to what? It's going to be equal to the mechanism moment, which is MPR plus the additional effect of this little bit of a cantilever. This is small cantilever that we discussed. This is going to be MF. Now, where is MF? MF is going to be the moment right at the face of the cone. Right? So we discussed this before. We know what is MF. MF is going to be equal to the mechanism moment plus the mechanism shear multiplied by SH plus the effect of this cantilever. You have a little bit of moment. You can ignore this if you like to. This is not critical because use the gravity moment is not that critical compared to the seismic moment. And you find out that this is going to be very small. It's almost like less than half percent. So you can ignore it in your analysis. You don't really need to consider this. Just take this MF based on the probable shear multiplied by SH plus the probable moment, which is a mechanism moment. Say so now, once you have this MF, right? Now think about what happens. Once the mechanism is gonna start to happen, you're gonna be pushing the column this way. And also this one's gonna be pushing the column this way. Meaning that in reality, you apply this EF in here and EF in there. If you remember this equation, I'll take you back. You remember this equation? PMPE divided by DB minus TF, meaning what? It's going to be the amount of tensile compression that you're going to have in the beam flange, right? You consider here that the web itself is not taking any tensile compression, and most of the force is going to be through the flange. Exactly what we do here. This EF is going to be actually is going to be going through the flange of the beam. And the distance between the middle of the flange to the middle of the flange is going to be called here DP. So I'm going to say this force EF, what is EF equals to? I'd like you to write my equation. You can say EF is equal to MF divided by DP. So, okay. Now let's see the equation here. It's gonna be only one MF or two MFs. You can say, well, if there is no extension for this beam in this side, maybe you'll just take one. But in this case, you have two moments. So you can say here, total summation, or you can say here in this case, two MF divided by DP. Look at this equation here. It says DP is gonna be equal to the depth of the column, subtracting two CF. So, okay, how about MF? We have the MF equation. R sub u, which is equal to EF, here's EF, right? And just, you know, this is supposed to be for the beam. Excuse me, this is their table. This is not my table, but this is supposed to be for the beam, right? It's all supposed to be for the beam. And even look at the picture. This is a picture from their uh, from their uh, their document. It shows DP to be for the beam, not for the column. Anyways, so this force that I'm talking about here is going to be equal to some mesh of the mom at the face divided by DP. So, okay, yeah, it makes sense. You add all of this divided by DP. It's going to give you this force. So, okay, good. How much shear that goes to the column? Let's give you my question. How can I draw the shear diagram? You can say, how would you find out VC? Say, so to find out VC, I'm going to be taking the moment about this point. So, right about this point, let's start here to take the moment for all the forces acting in here. And instead of this two MFs, I replace them with EF. So, it is either that use MF or use EF. So, I'm going to say, Let's take the moment here. I'm going to say summation of M at this point is going to be equal to zero, correct? I say, okay, this is good. Now, now let's take the moment here. You either consider EF or FF, excuse me, or you consider MF because MF and, e and, and FF is the same thing. They're not like... You don't have this force also at the same time you have this MF. 
So I can say here, I have, if I take the moment about this point, I'm gonna say I have two times MF, two times MF. Forget about this, you don't have it now, right? You either put FF or you put MF. So in this case, I'm gonna say, I'll put here MF instead of this FF. So, okay, I have two MF, it's gonna be equal to VC times H. Does this make sense? Here's H, here's VC. When you take the moment about this point, this force here is gonna get canceled. Now I have MF plus MF, right? Is gonna be equal to VC times H. It's gonna be opposite. So this two MFs is gonna be rotating counterclockwise and VC is gonna be rotating clockwise. Someone can put the equation differently. Someone can say, well, I can say two MF negative, I'm gonna say here VC times H is gonna be equal to zero. You can do it also this way, right? Take the moment about this point. You say MF plus MF minus VC times H is gonna be equal to zero, which is the same equation as this. And with that, you can figure out VC. Now here's the datum for the shear diagram. Now I'm gonna be moving here with the shear. It says here VC, okay, you start here by VC, you go straight. And then once you start here, you find out this force FF is gonna be from here to there. So it's gonna be a drop in the shear diagram from here to there, this is gonna be FF. And then you're gonna be going straight up. And then what happens? You have another force taking you, which is the other FF. It's gonna be taking you all the way to the other side. You're gonna have another shear, right? In the column itself. And then you're gonna be going straight, no change from this point to that point. And then you close the diagram with another VC. Now, based on this diagram, you ask yourself a question. How much is the shear in the column? You can see the shear in the column is gonna be this, right? It's gonna be this value here. How about the shear in the panel zone? You can say the shear in the panel zone can be only VZ, V sub Z, shear in the panel zone. Or someone's gonna say, you know what? The whole FF is gonna be the entire shear that I need to transfer through the panel zone. I'd like to design for it. Or you can say, fine, if this is gonna be your um, request. Now, after you find here R sub U, now R sub U is gonna be equal to the total force, which means this one, right? So according to this document and this example, this is gonna be the shear demand. It's gonna be F sub F, which is the same as R sub U, right? Now you need to find out the trends of the panel zone. So it says here, it's gonna be phase on the panel zone. And just you know, the Doppler plate is gonna be this little plate that you add to the column web. This equation, it says phi RV, which is the strength for the Doppler plate or for the plate for this, uh, for the panel zone is gonna be equal to phi and you know that phi usually is gonna be equal to one. And then you have 0.6 times Fy. This gonna be the standard when you have shear trends times the depth of the column. We can see, yeah, depth of the column, now it makes sense. I understand depth of the column times T web. This T web is not gonna be only T web of the column. This T web is gonna be the total thickness. What do you mean by total thickness? I'm gonna say it's gonna be the thickness, total thickness meaning including the Doppler plate. So this T web that you use in this equation, right? Is gonna be equal to the column web thickness plus the Doppler plate thickness. And then you have some other factors. This is to account for the aspect ratio of the, of the size of the panel zone. It says here, T web that used here in this analysis is gonna be equal to T of the column web plus the thickness of the Doppler plate, just to confirm what I was saying. So actually this gave you the total thickness, right? This gave you from here to there, right? This gave you the whole thing. So if you run your analysis here and then you use T web to be only the column web thickness, which means that you set T of the Doppler plate to be equal to zero, and you find out that this phi RV is gonna be less than R sub U, what do you do? You start to add the plate. And of course, you're not gonna be adding quarter of an inch of plate, you're gonna start maybe at half an inch of plate minimum, or maybe five eight, or maybe three quarter of an inch of plate. And then you're gonna go back to the same equation to prove that phi RV is gonna be equal to R sub U or more. Are you guys following me or no? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, good. Um, 
just to continue here about these factors that you see, you're going to see here definition for DZ and for WZ. This gives you the Doppler plate that you're looking at, which is this plate here. I can just put a box around it. Let's give you the Doppler plate, right? Usually extended at least six inches above and below the continuity plate. This is giving you the continuity plate. See this and this? To make it easy on not to do the wheel thickness analysis, you see the wheel thickness analysis that I did of the continuity plate? Just to make it easy for myself, I can just do here full pin weld. See this? Complete penetration weld on three sides. So it's giving this side, this side, and that side. If you do complete penetration, which is full pin weld, it means you don't really need to do any analysis for the weld. Does this make sense? No. Yes. How's that? Now explain me. It's your chance. Wouldn't it be covering the entire area of that because it's fully penetrating? Yeah. That way there wouldn't be kind of the, the well Absolutely. maybe checks like that. So you've got to try it. So here's a plate. Let's say that I have a plate that I'd like to weld to this uh, column flange. So what I decided to do, just do like this, right? And just cut the plate on an angle like this, then come back and then fill it completely with welding material, right? Let's give you like this. So what did I do? I filled all of this section here with weld material, which is exactly the same as the thickness of the plate. We call this full pin weld, full penetration weld. So in this case, the entire force that you have in the plate can get transferred through the entire weld material. We understand that this weld material that has a yield strength or ultimate strength of 70 KSI, which means it's stronger than the plate. So you don't really have to care about the weld design here. You're not gonna have a fillet weld, you're gonna have a full pin weld. So usually if you like to um, just make it easy for yourself and you don't wanna do weld analysis, you can just specify full pin weld. The bad thing about this full pin weld, just give you the cost. So someone else is gonna be paying for it. <laughs> Excuse me, sir? Yes. Sir, in full pin weld, wouldn't the weld be, um... You can weaker as compared to normal welding. Um, we don't call it normal welding. We call it fillet weld. Yes, sir. D do but you know what, what I'm talking about when I say fillet weld? Yes, sir. Okay. Or should I bring it? Should I put it on quick? No, sir. I remember what fillet weld is. But uh, isn't uh, this weld uh, weaker than fillet weld? I mean, fun pin. In you can fun, do fillet uh, weld. You can do fillet weld if you want to. Yes, sir. Here's when a fillet weld. Let's give you like this, right? But the fillet yes, weld, I can change the thickness of it. I can make it as thick as a plate or I can make it much smaller. But this type of weld, if you look at it, I'm taking the entire thickness and just put the fillet material, the weld material in there. So I'm kind of developing the entire plate throughout this, the, throughout this section. Look at this. This could be like complete penetration, very similar to the complete penetration. This could be just fill it well, right? So this one here, it just transfer the force and you don't need to do any analysis for it. If you specify complete penetration well, you don't really need to do any analysis to it. Like in this case here, the entire plate here is interrupted by the welding material, by the, the material itself. And the strength of this material is gonna be 70 KSI. The strength of this material Maximum is going to be 50 KSR. So you know that the weld is stronger than the plate. So you don't really need to provide an answer. But in a case like this, when you have here partial, this gave be partial penetration or partial pin weld. In this case, you may need to do some analysis. In this case, also you need to do some analysis. And fillet weld, you need to do also uh, this analysis. So all what you need to do is to provide this pebble and through the pebble, you fill it with the welding material. And this is exactly what we have in this case. See, this says here complete penetration weld on three sides, which means one, two, and the three is going to be two 
the Doppler plate or to the column web. And now there is something usually in columns, and I'm sure if you have taken advanced reinforced concrete design, now which one do you want it to be stronger at the end of the day? Is it the column or the beam? And is there a reason for this? The column. And what is the reason for it? Because if if a plastic hinge it placed in the column, the whole building is going to collapse, but it, it's more susceptible to the collapse of the building. So you want the buildings it. that you'd like to have a stronger column weak beam. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to say the reason that we have this, what is this? I'm going to say when you have a column and a beam, right? This gives you the column, this gives you the beam. You take summation of all the column strength. You see this summation of PC, moment of PC, divide by summation of the moment strength of the beam. And this needs to be more than 1.0. I guess in concrete, we used to say one and a quarter, right? In concrete design. So in this case, I'd like to satisfy or to confirm that I'm going to have here a strong column, weak beam. It doesn't mean that I'm looking for a bad beam because it can be weak. No, all what it means that the column is going to be stronger than the beam. And this can be only in buildings. You can say only in buildings. Sir, do in we take a, yes. Sir, do we take the weak beam because uh, beam we have on we already have a lot of stuff for beam. For example, uh, the cutout section and everything which will give us time when the beam collapses. Whereas in column we don't have any safety measures. You can say that we are cutting the RBS, we are putting the RBS, and we are doing all of this business to confirm this issue, because that's one of the things that we'd like to confirm. We want to be sure that the column is not hinging before the beam. Otherwise, the beam is going to collapse. And this is what I'm going to be talking about very soon. OK. OK, all right. But in bridges, we don't want this. In bridges, we would prefer, so I'm going to say here, is going to be strong beam weak column and bridges just remember this i'm expecting in your final for sure you're gonna have a question on this issue why do you prefer a strong column weak beam in buildings now you need to explain it or maybe i'm going to give you a few options and you pick one of them Here's a column moment, and here's a beam moment, and I guess you guys are aware of all of these factors, right, and all of the symbols. All right. Lateral brace of column, this gave be for you. If you want to read it, read it. So I'm going to say here, this gave be for reading. Start from here all the way to the end. I'm going to say here for reading. Professor? Yeah. Uh, when you typed uh, earlier on the other slide that we want a stronger be uh, beam weak column and bridges, uh, what was the reason for that? Yeah, because um, um, just, you know, in bridges, the cost of the bridge deck itself or the box girder is going to be extremely high compared to the cost of the column. And if the entire beam, which means a box girder, is going to start to yield, you're gonna have a disaster because just cars and, and people's gonna be right on the top of the bridge. It's gonna be much easier if the entire bridge is gonna be kind of coming down a little bit, but not to collapse. And then you can jack it back, you can jack it up back, right? And then you can fix the column. But in beams, if the entire building here is gonna start to collapse, you cannot really jack it up. For a bridge, you can bring uh, good size jacks and start to jack the the, uh, the bridge box girder. But in buildings, you cannot. You cannot really lift it up. And you're going to have a disaster. Lots of people are going to get dying there. They're going to get killed. You don't want this to happen. Of course. OK, thank you. All right, no problem. Now, Professor, I, yes. Uh, the, for the strong column and weak beam that the, the diagram you draw, for this, some of the 
beam framing to the joints. Do we need to consider the torsional rigidity of the beams, which is framed out out of plane of the don't have normal? To. You can, if you like, you can because okay. Let me explain uh, the question here. When you think about this, you have also beams coming perpendicular to the screen. And the question is, when it comes to this, should we also include it? So I'm gonna say, if you can have a value for it and you'd like to include it, if you think it's getting considerable value, of course you need to include it. But you can just ignore it as long as you have here a good factor. So use the advice, don't go to 1.0. The advice is you should go to one and quarter. You'd like to see maybe 1.2. And once you get to 1.2, you're going to be covering all the torsional resistance of the other beams framing into this joint. Yeah. But good point. Thank you, Juan. Yeah. Okay. Now let's look here at this example. I'm going to be going here quick through it. I guess we start by looking at this already. We said that we have the beam and the column size given to us. We have the properties, right? We have 992 and also 992 for the seal itself. And we have the beam size, we have the load, and I don't really care about the code, right? It says here, here's the code. I don't care about all of this. It doesn't matter as long as this is gonna be a good exercise for me. You can say here's the beam parameters, all the section parameters. Same thing for the column or the column parameters. Now the connection design. I'm going to be going with A, B, and C. If you remember the A, B, and C, A, B, and C is going to be for the RBS. I'm going to be checking the RBS values. Again, is the code limits, right? And then find out the R, which is the radius for the cut. Now, I have the clearest pan. If you remember this, I need to have the clearest pan, which is L prime. So first, I have the center to center span, L sub zero. Once you have your L sub zero, you should be able to figure out now SH. And SH is gonna be equal to the column, which means the depth of the column. And you have this size already. And then you have the A and B. A and B here is gonna be the A and B for the RBS. This is the one that you're gonna start with, like this A and B and C, if you remember this A, B and C. Here's SH. And based on this SH, here's gonna be the clear distance from the center of the plastic hinge to center of the plastic hinge. So this is gonna be L sub zero, center of column to center of column. It's gonna be L prime, which is, or the clear from the center of the hinge to center of the hinge. And then also you have the ZE, which is a plastic section of the RBS. It's gonna be equal to the plastic section of the beam, right? And where is this 1190 come from? It's gonna be come from here. If you look back, here's 1190 for the beam. ZXB, this is gonna be for the beam before the cut. And after the cut, this is gonna be ZE, right? You're gonna be subtract all of these factors. Now it's gonna be reduced value, much reduced values. Now CPR, this is gonna be the increase because of the strain hardening, and it should be less than 1.2. Now what happened if it's gonna be more than 1.2, you just use 1.2. It's gonna be like a limit or a cap. So based on this material given to you, the A992 is gonna be equal to 115. And here's the NPR, which is a mechanism mod. And you can leave it here as a kip inch if you like. Uh, I usually just use everything here in kip foot. It's just a habit in our spreadsheets, but this is fine. You can just keep it kip inch. And the only reason that we prefer to have it as a kip foot, so the numbers is not gonna be big because this number is gonna be really big. When you think here about 48,000, right? It's gonna be a big number, 48,000, which is the number is big. You don't want to see big numbers while you're working. You'd like to see numbers that you can think about. Uh, well, here's the, the mechanism moment. And then after that, you figure out the mechanism shear. It's gonna be two MPR divided by L prime. And of course you add the gravity load to it. Uh, if you like to ignore the gravity load, some people just ignore it because it's usually small, but let's see here the values. Look at this value here. You have VPR, the mechanism shear 391. And look at the shear, you have 28. So someone's gonna say, well, this may be like seven, eight percent. I would include it. Some people just say ignore it, and provided that I'm gonna have a stronger beam at the end when I do the shear check. So usually we include it, we don't we don't ignore any of that. Now for the mechanism shear or the V at the RBS connection, I'm gonna have one that adds the gravity 
this gave me the graph usually, and then it's gonna be plus the 391, and the other one's gonna be subtracting the 391. Why? Because VPR, this mechanism shear, one of them is gonna be going up in the same direction as the gravity load, and this one is gonna be subtracted, right? It's gonna be um, subtracted from the equation, which is this one here. So you're gonna have here 419 kips versus 363. Of course, this one controls. So I'm gonna be using this for the shear check. Now you need to find out the moment at the face, face of the column. Now this is gonna be the newest edge. Here's the newest edge, not to the center of the column, it's gonna be to here. And with that, you can figure out MF. So MF is gonna be equal to the mechanism shear plus the shear that you have at the RBS, the 419, multiplied by SH. So I said, okay. On the other side, you're gonna have the other sheet, the 363. It doesn't help much because it's gonna be here subtractive, right? So I'm not gonna be using this. This is gonna be control of my design. And this can be the additional, this considering that you have a small cantilever here. And look at this value here, 48. 48 kip inch compared to 58,000. So in this case, you can ignore this if you want to. But again, we don't usually ignore it because you, at the end, you're gonna have a spreadsheet. You can just leave it in there. Now you compare this M at the face, you compare it to MPE. What is MPE here? It's gonna be the capacity of the section right at the face of the column, which means not at the RBS. You take ZXB, the 1190, multiply by 1.1, multiply by 50, and CPR is not used here. And the fee factor usually in this case is gonna be taken as one. Well. This can be a good design when you have like 90%. You don't want the beam to be a lot stronger than the RBS connection in this case. So you don't want to see here maybe 0.7 or 0.8. You'd like to have it maybe 0 0.9, 0 0.95. If it becomes here 0 0.7 and 0.8, you know that you're going to have trouble with the shear. Okay. Here's the shear again, 419. You'd like here to check the shear trends of the beam itself. You can say, I have your compact section, right? And here's the shear trends, 985. Shear is good. So in this case, the choice of this beam was good in shear. How about the continuity plate? Do we need it or we don't need it? This is gonna be about the flange thickness of the column. So we run this equation here for the flange thickness requirement. It says here 274. It's okay. Also, it needs to be 2.77. How about our column, our choice here? What column thickness did we use? The column thickness that we have used is actually 2.2. So we need to have continuity plates on both sides of the column. So again, this is what is needed. It needs to be at least 2.74. Instead of changing the column size, you can leave the column size as is and just add the continuity plate. This gonna be here, the cross-section area exposed to tension. If you remember, it's gonna be equal to um, the width of the flange multiplied by the thickness. And here's the B of the column. And it's gonna be up to you. As I said, you can disregard this out of your equation if you want to. If you decide not to use this TCW, this is fine which means it's gonna be just 16.8 divided by two, and then you continue with the equation. This is gonna be up to you. I'm gonna leave it here for your judgment. I personally, in all the spreadsheets, we don't consider this. We just take it out because it doesn't make any sense. Now, with that, you're gonna have here the face area. This can be the area exposed to tension. Now you need to find out the trends of it. And also you're gonna have another area exposed to shear. This can be the exposed area to shear which is gonna be the, to the web of the column. It's gonna be like the side area. Again, they subtracted here two to CF. We don't do this usually, so it's gonna be up to you. You can just disregard this term, which is the same as this term, but we can use this, gonna be up to you. I personally, I don't use it, but you have it there in the equation. Now, this gonna be the air exposed to shear. Now for the trends, as we said that we are gonna have four items here that we need to take the smallest of all of them and use to design the web. The first one is gonna be the trends and tension. Yeah, it's gonna be the trends of this area here, the 9.31, now it's gonna be in tension. And look at the plate, this is not 836 plates. This is all 50 KSI plates. And this is gonna be very common for seismic framing and seismic members, we use 50 KSI plates, just remember this. For the shear strength, it's gonna be here's the shear strength, which means a side, and look at this intention. You have the trends of the continuity plate of 838, and then shears gave me 1176. So I'm gonna say, you know what? 
This one here is not gonna be controlled my design. For now, this here control of my design, the smallest of all of them, right? So it's gonna be item A and B. This is very strong in shear, which is good. Now let's look here at the Doppler plate thing. Do we need to have Doppler plate or not? This is gonna be like, this is step 11. So for now, I'm gonna be just, just concerned that we went there and we have these two values. And as you see here, these two values are really big. So it's gonna be controlling my design. Now this gonna be the actual force that goes, right? based on the strength here. This gives you the trends of the beam, right? Divided by the depth from the center of the flange, center of the flange. You give me here 3,600 kips. This gives you a lot. So actually this gives you the force that I'm gonna be using to design my weld trends. As it says here, the smallest value is gonna be used to design the weld between the continuity plate and the column weld. Here's the equation. You're gonna be taking the total trends and tension in this case, which is the smallest of all the four cases these four cases divided by the length and this length is gonna be also again it's gonna be up to you you can disregard this it's gonna be up to you right if you want to keep it there it's gonna be okay little bit conservativity is okay acceptable and then you divide here by two because you have two sides of the plate and then you have 1.39 and then you have the length with that you have 0.78 one inch now you need to take this divide by two because actually for this force here that you are talking about, you're gonna have four sides. So I'm gonna divide this by two. Once you divide this by two, it's gonna be a number of sixteen of an inch. It's gonna be seven sixteen. So you can do here full pin weld if you like to get rid of this and just make it simple when it comes to, uh, in many cases, it considered to be kind of simple in construction because you don't want the weld to be sticking above and this can be creating trouble to clean it, to clean the top of it without damaging it. So the column panel zone. This is gonna be the one that we use in our analysis. If you remember this DP, this gonna be DP for the beam, right? See here, it says DP, DB of the beam minus TBF of the beam. You remember this? Let me put the slide back. The one that I said most likely is just gonna be like a typo. Look at this equation again. DP is gonna be equal to what? DB minus DBF. Look at this. It says for column, right? Let's give it for the column, right? But when it comes to the analysis of this example, they did it correctly. So you have the moment at the face of the column, you divide by the depth, which is from the center of the flange to center of the flange, right? And then with that, you get the demand. So the demand shear that you have in the panel zone is gonna be equal to that value, right? And in this case, of course, you're gonna have some measure of MF. Now look at the strengths given from this equation. This TW for now is gonna be the column web thickness only. Now, if you like to have more thickness, it means that you need continuity plate. What happened, we tried first, this TW is gave you the column. We tried the strength is gave you 1600 kips only compared to this 3200. So we really need Doppler plate. So in this case, we're gonna put another Doppler plate. So you can add more thickness to it. So in a case like this, you say, if this gave be 1.22, I guess I need to have maybe one quarter or maybe one and a half inch Doppler plate. So that the total is gonna be maybe two and fraction two and a half or something like this. The way that is done here, the way that they are doing it here, they are trying to find out the thickness of the plate. The way that we usually do it on our spreadsheets, we just change this value here. We just add additional thickness. So in this case, let's say that I'm doing here um, a quick uh, spreadsheet for it. You're gonna say here T web of the column equals and in this case, gave me 1.2. It's gonna be read automatically from the, I'm gonna say from the database for the sections. I'm gonna say here T of the continuity plate, CT of continuity plate. This makes sense. And this is gonna be my variable, something that I'm gonna put here by hand. So I'm gonna say maybe a couple of hatches here. T web, which what is T web here? If anyone following me? T web. Is what is gonna be the value that I use in this equation is gonna be equal to T web of the column plus 
T of the continuity plane. And then I take this value here and use it in this equation, which is TW, right? So once I feel here that I have a red flag, which means this R sub U is gonna be less than P R V, what do I need to do? Just add some number here. Gonna be adding, let's say, let me add here one inch, right? If one inch is gonna make it work fine. If not, I'm gonna be adding, I'm gonna say one and three eighths, let's say one and a half. So in this case here, it's gonna be one and a half because based on this analysis, they say it's gonna be 1.46. So it is either that you can write an equation to figure out the Doppler plate thickness, and if you don't need it, you're gonna have your negative number, or you can just play with this number here. You start with zero, and then you start at some numbers till you prove that you have more phi v r v more than r sub u. Any questions? No, I think we're good. All right, great. No questions at the moment. Okay, thank you. Now, the last thing for us is to confirm that the column beam, right, ratio, strength ratio is gonna be more than one, according to the code. We would like it to be like 1.2. This is usually what we are targeting. Using our analysis, if you'd like to do a good design here, don't go to 1.0, try to make it a little bit larger. So what you need to do is find out the strength of the column based on this equation. You see here Z of the column, right? And then you have two of them because you have two columns above and below. And also for the beams, you have your two beams, one to the right, one to the left. So in this case, you may think that here is one column and here is one beam, another column. So in this case, I'm addressing this case. I'm not talking about this one because in this case here, I'm gonna have two columns versus one beam. So I know for sure it's gonna be working fine, right? When you look here, summation of the moment capacity of the column, you're gonna have one and two. Divide by summation moment of the beam, which means this one. Yeah, I'm sure that this is gonna work. So actually this check is not needed. The check that I need to do is gonna be for this guy here, for this connection, because I'm gonna have here two beams and two columns. If this makes sense, it's okay. The trends of one column here is gonna be given by this equation, then you're gonna say multiply by two. Here's the trends of one column. If you notice here, the trends of one column is gonna have here a subtractive term just to reduce the effect of the axial load. So if you have some axial load, we call this axial load index. This is known like this, we call this axial. Oh, what happened? Load index. And this axial load index is gonna be equal to P sub U divided by the cross-section area of the column. Here it grows. So you need to subtract the axial load index. So for example, if you have uh, this column here, if it's really heavily loaded, which we don't want uh, moment frame columns to be heavily loaded, it means the trends of the column is gonna get reduced. You don't want this to happen. So we try to make it as light as possible. We are not intending here to load the columns heavily. And now look at the beam capacity here. This is gonna be CPR, you consider the CPR, the strain hardening, you consider the R sub Y, you consider the F sub Y, which is the unit trends of the beam, and then Z of the RBS plus M V. But look at the problem here. This is the thing that maybe you're gonna say, this is not fair. How come when it comes to the capacity of the column that you want it to be high, how come you don't have the CPR and you don't have this R sub y, the 1.1, how come you don't have it, right? But when it comes to the strength of the beam, you have all of them. It's kind of unfair when you think about it, you say you are comparing strength to a strength. So when you look here, the strength of the column, you don't add here the effect of the 1.1, the R sub y, right? The specified versus the actual unit strength. And also you did not include the strain hardening, right? You didn't do any of that for the column, but for the beams, you added it, which means that you made it tougher on us. I guess now this explains why in the reverse concrete design, we have the moment capacity of the column versus moment capacity of the beam directly. And in that case, you need to include the probable strength. In this case here in the steel design, you don't really include it. And this is why they put it at 1.0, as if, 
just just you guys know as if in concrete design we don't do it this way in concrete design we do comparison here and this needs to be six divided by five which means 1.2 but our target here is going to be one and quarter so i'm going to put this, this here in concrete design this factor right i'm going to say this factor is going to be equal to 1.2 according to the code right in the steel design this factor is only 1.0 and here's the reason. In concrete design, all these factors, whatever increase factor that you have for the probable factors to get to the probable moment, right? We use it for columns and beams, right? So in this case, I can go to a factor of 1.2. For a steel design, if you look here at the equations, the CPR, which is the effect of the strain hardening and the effect of the probable yield strength is used in the beams. So it is already included, this 20% actually is already included in our equations. They take care of it already. That's why they kept it to be 1.0. But still, when we are doing here a steel design, we'd like to go to a factor more than 1.2 or one and a quarter. As you see here, it came to be 1.27, which is more than one. Any questions? Because the rest of this is gonna be for you reading only. So this guy, I'm gonna put this here for reading only. Start from here all the way to the end. With that, I'm done with the example for the special moment frame design. And our next um, lecture is giving on the plastic analysis of moment frames, which is right here. So this coming lecture, we're gonna be covering this slide set and also we're going to be talking about the project and uh, maybe by this evening or maybe tomorrow evening i'm going to be posting um uh, project assignment the submit of assignment for you guys any questions before i let you go no i think uh we're pretty clear a, a bit to read okay thank you elizabeth thank you very much Thank you, Professor. All right, I'll let you go. You guys have a good night. Professor? Yes. If you want to talk to you through office hours, um, do we have to reserve a certain time with you right now? Um, well, if you like, I'm here. I can wait. Uh, maybe after everybody's going to be leaving, I can open the office hour if you want to. I can see you there. Yes, because it's kind of like personal. <laughs> sure, absolutely. No problem. Good night, Professor. All right, good night. Have a great good night. night, Professor. All right, good night. Oh, Professor, yeah. I just wanted to note that I was watching videos and trying to learn as much about engineering. I saw you have your SE, which yeah. is pretty amazing. I was oh, seeing that there's you. a 30% pass rate for that. So I just yeah. wanted to I just wanted to say congratulations on that. <laughs> very, you. very impressive. This happens. Uh, actually, it happens late in my career because, you know, uh, I came as international student to the U.S., but it happens like 20 years ago. Wow. So, <laughs> <laughs> but so thank you for congratulating me, but that, that, that was in the past. Thank you. No, but it's still amazing. I mean, yeah, those... thank you. one day you will do it. If you're interested, one day you'll do it. It's not yeah. hard. Believe me, it's not hard. No? <laughs> no All right. Hard. Perfect. No. Well, I'll let you go. Have a good night, All Professor. Right. Good night. Good night.